It is my pleasure and my honor to introduce Mia Bay, uh, who is the Roy F. and Jeanette P. Nichols Professor of American History at University of Pennsylvania. Uh, prior to going to Penn uh, in January of last year, Mia worked at Rutgers University, where she was professor of history and the director of the Rutgers Center for Race and Ethnicity. She is a scholar of American and African American intellectual, cultural, and social history, whose recent interests include black women's thought, African American approaches to citizenship, and the history of race and transportation, about the latter of which we will hear more shortly. She has a PhD and, and a Master's of Philosophy from Yale and a BA from the University of Toronto. Mia's publications include, I could say Professor Bay, but <laughs> you know, include The White Image in the Black Mind, African American Ideas About White People, 1830 to 1925. Come on in. Come on in. published by Oxford in 2000, To Tell the Truth Freely, The Life of Ida B. Wells, uh, Farrar Strauss and Giroux, 2009, and the edited work Ida B. Wells, The Light of Truth, The Writings of an Anti-Lynching Crusader, uh, published by Penguin, and of course, hordes and hordes and hordes of articles and book chapters. Mia is the co-author with Waldo Martin and Deborah Gray White of the textbook Freedom on My Mind, A History of African Americans with the Documents, and the editor of two collections of essays toward an intellectual history of black women, which she co-edited with Farrah Jasmine Griffin, Martha Jones, and Barbara Savage, and Race and Retail, Consumption Across the Color Line, which she co-edited with Anne Fabian. That was published in 2015 by Rutgers University Press. Her current projects include a new book entitled Traveling Black, A Social History of Segregated Transportation, which is forthcoming from Harvard in 2020, and a book on the history of African American ideas about Thomas Jefferson. Jazz Perla and I interviewed her last summer for our Notes on the State Project, and we're hoping to pick your brain a little bit more while you're here. Mia's work has been supported by the Fletcher Foundation, the National Humanities Center, the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies at Monticello, the American Council of Learned Societies, Boston University's Institute on Race and Social Division, Harvard University's Charles Warren Center, and the W.E.B. Du Bois Centers and American Historical Association. She is an organization of American historians distinguished lecturer and a member of the executive board of the Society of American Historians. She serves on the editorial boards of Reviews in American History, Modern Intellectual History, the Journal of African American History, and the African American Intellectual History Society's Black Perspectives Blog. I could go on, but then I would be taking up the time to like, come on in, Lorraine, <laughs> or for the lecture. But this is the distinguished uh, career and uh, prodigious outfit, uh, or output, <laughs> <laughs> of Mia Bay. Please join me in welcoming. Thank you. Uh, the talk I'm giving today, Race on the Road in the Automotive Age, is part of my uh, new book, Traveling Black, which has chapters on traveling by train, traveling by car, traveling by airplane, traveling by bus. And I'll be happy to talk about any of those subjects. But today, I want to focus on cars, especially in the era when they first kind of start. So I will start with um, Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson loved to drive. Um, a big black man who carried himself with swaggering self-confidence. Johnson was, of course, best known as a boxer and appalled 
much of the white world when he became the world's first black heavyweight champion in 1908. Johnson's mastery of boxing sweet science was a challenge to white mas masculinity, and so too was his penchant for dating white women, which he did frequently and very publicly. Um, his love of cars was also a problem. He was a man who was far too hot-headed um, and proud to be comfortable traveling Jim Crow, so he began buying automobiles as soon as they became available. By 1909, he owned five cars, which he drove everywhere. His command of cars, as cultural critic Paul Gilroy notes, drew hostility, harassment, and an interjected covetous ad admiration among policemen wherever he went. Um, he received tickets for speeding, reckless driving, obstructing traffic, and other, other moving violations whenever he drove, um, which discouraged him not at all. He often parked his cars on the sidewalk in Chicago um, and once told a judge that his constant speeding was um, simply done for advertising purposes. He also toyed with the idea of becoming a racing car driver and actually muscled his way into the all-white world of automobile racing by offering a $5,000 purse to any driver who could beat him. This reward was necessary because the membership in the American Automobile Association, which was the organization that controlled racing at that time, was limited to whites, and the organization's contest board refused to license Johnson or sanction any race in which he participated. Its stance received the enthusiastic support of the Auto um, Automobiles Association's drivers, who were all but unanimous in denouncing Johnson as too ignorant of the mechanical end of an automobile to be a worthy opponent. In the end, however, the lure of the $5,000 purse proved too much for reigning world champion Barney Oldfield. Um, in 1910, he defied the AAA contest board's color bar to beat Johnson in a race. He collected his money, but was banned from the racing circuit for more than a year. Uh, for deigning to race Johnson. Uh, automobile racing, as some of you may know, would remain an all-white sport for a number of years to come. Still, Johnson didn't need to win races or even drive quickly to attract attention as a driver. One of the few black men of his era to own even one car, Johnson was once arrested while cruising slowly down Broadway in New York City. Um, he was arrested for driving a car with Chicago plates in this particular case. Um, and he was, at that point, disgusted to be stopped yet again and said, I go fast, they arrest me, and now it seems like if I go slow, they arrest me the same. Next thing, somebody will arrest me for being a brunette in a blonde town. <laughs> As Johnson was clearly quite aware, his race was responsible for much of the outrage and anxiety his driving inspired among white women. Both the police who um, harassed Johnson and the AAA drivers who refused to race him drew on a variety of stereotypes about black people to question the black prize fighter's ability to own and operate a car. As the 20th century first opened, car ownership was largely limited to very wealthy whites. So Johnson disrupted established hierarchies of class and color associated with operating an automobile every time he got behind the wheel. Uh, moreover, the fact that he drove himself was equally problematic, um, often barred from skilled jobs during that time period. Blacks were also widely held to lack mechanical aptitude. Um, but Johnson drove with ease and even took on white champions. As Johnson could tell us, the technological transformations of the automotive age offered African-American travelers both new forms of mobility and new sites of racial contestation. Cars were, from the beginning, a symbol of freedom and mobility for Americans. As the automobile age opened, many whites waxed eloquent about how the automobile offered its driver an opportunity to be his own station master and porter with no one's time to make up but his own. They also celebrated the fact that cars freed their owners from traversing the same old scenes, 
again and again. You could go off road, you could go all sorts of places. Um, African Americans no doubt appreciated the fact that, uh, no doubt appreciated these advances as well, but they above all saw automotive technology as a potential escape from the rolling segregation of the Jim Crow car. As early as 1924, black newspapers such as Atlanta's The Independent were encouraging readers to buy a car of your own and escape Jim Crowism. Accordingly, even during the early days of driving when cars were still expensive, unreliable, and useful primarily for local transportation, the ever transgressive Jack Johnson was not the only African American to embrace the new technology. Other well-to-do blacks, such as doctors, ministers, businessmen, and entertainers also welcomed the freedom and status that automobile owning confer conferred. Meanwhile, the first working class African Americans to master this new technology did not purchase their own at automobiles. They tended to work as chauffeurs and mechanics. However, as early as the World War I era, uh, black farm families even began to purchase cars and Jim Crow Jitney bus services sprang up to allow blacks who could not afford to buy their own cars to travel to work by car. As jo Jack Johnson's experiences underscore automotive technology, oh, let me just show you, Jitney bus is sort of forgotten today, though Uber is really the modern day equivalent. <laughs> And there was a jitney craze in the World War I era where a lot of people bought relatively cheap um, Ford automobiles and sort of used them as local buses. Um, so, um, but as Jack Johnson's experiences would in score and other stories of the early automotive age, automotive technology would only go so far in allowing blacks to really escape Jim Crow. Um, Privately owned cars provided black Americans who could afford them with a small space in which they could escape some of segregation's humiliations. But traveling by car, or even more obviously by bus or jitney, is not really private. Driving any distance by car involves entering what sociologist John Uri has defined as a system of automobility. The system is defined not only by its user's commitment um, to cars as their major means of transportation, but also by the industries and services that make car ownership actually useful. Um, they're too lengthy to really list and fill, but they include things like road building and maintenance, hotels, roadside service, um, service areas, car sales and repair, uh, repair workshops, suburban house building, um, advertising, marketing, urban design, planning, parking, all these things that we need when we use a car. Um, moreover, as a sociologist John Uri also emphasizes, the car also has an important symbolic status within the system of automobility. It's never just a car. Instead, cars are generally um, most owners' major item of individual consumption after housing and provide status through their owners through various kinds of sign values, such as speed, security, safety, sexual desire, career success, they're associated with a lot of different things. And cars can also attract the attention of the criminal justice system, as we saw in the case of Jack Johnson. So in short, the, both cars and the system of automobility in which they operate um, are deeply, can be deeply racialized in a variety of ways. Um, in the early days of the automobile, that, that became clear in the early days of automobiles, um, when whites initially debated whether uh, blacks should be allowed to drive at all, with some, man, some maintaining that driving was a white man's occupation. Um, such whites in the early days of cars questioned whether blacks really had the capacity to master the, a complex machine, and they also worried that the sense of power that driving might give a driver would have an undesirable effect on black people. A law should be passed prohibiting any Negro from driving an automobile, one South Carolina governor maintained in 1911. He explained, in my experience, it makes them impudent, and the fact that they are driving a machine for the white man puts it into their head that they have the right of the way of the road and that everything and everyone should give way for them. 
However, debates over whether blacks should drive um, began to disappear during the World War I era. At this time, um, white labor was in short supply and cars had become relatively easy to operate. So car owners were no longer willing to pay premium prices to employ white mechanics as chauffeurs. Still, questions about whether blacks should own cars and what kind of cars they should own and where they should stop for service and roadside accommodations would prove far more persistent. For many years, African Americans were rarely thought of as car owners. Although they bought cars, automakers did not court their business and sometimes discouraged it. Um, blacks had poor access to credit and often had to buy used cars. And even blacks who could afford new cars sometimes purchased used cars instead. Um, that was because as a highly valuable and visible system of uh, um, object of conspicuous consumption, cars could easily provoke questions among Southern whites. Accordingly, some men during the segregation era who bought expensive cars would wear a chauffeur's cap to avoid offending whites, while other middle class black buyers chose their cars with an eye to white opinion. Um, and in terms of car advertising, there was very little courting of a black market until the mid to late 50s. Um, those who purchased new cars chose the make of their cars carefully. Um, in some portions of the South, NAACP ex Executive Secretary James Weldon Johnson said in 1927, possession of any car other than a Ford by colored people is frowned upon. Um, and writer William Styron echoed a similar sentiment more than 30 years later. He grew up in the South um, um, and revisiting it. In the 1960s, he found that black Southerners were more prosperous than they once were, but they still favored decent late model Fords over new model Buicks. Um, the, South, the Southern man's structures against Negro ostentatious remain intimidating, he concluded. However, owning even a modest vehicle was a point of pride among members of the Southern black middle class because car ownership allowed them to avoid traveling Jim Crow. Railway segregation, many believed, was instituted at least in part to humiliate the better class of Negroes, as one such traveler noted in 1927. Um, and cars were a way to beat the white man at its own game. Um, during these early years of car ownership, blacks who could afford cars prided themselves in owning cars that take themselves wherever they wish to go. Um, for instance, a well-to-do black North Carolinian told sociologist Charles Johnson when he was researching segregation in the 1940s, of course the Negroes ride Jim Crow here, but I don't ride in it. I just don't ride trains now. I use my car to drive anywhere I want to go. That's the reason I have a car. Still, car ownership was a far from perfect escape from Jim Crow. Service stations, roadside restaurants, hotels, auto camps, and other, black, other businesses that took shape around American automobility were rarely designed with black travelers in mind. Instead, in the South, such institutions were, were segregated by law, and they were off limits to blacks in many other states simply as a matter of custom. Likewise, even the state regulation of driving was rarely race neutral. Blacks then as now were frequently targeted for traffic violations. Um, and also during the segregation era, subject to a variety of largely unwritten traffic laws in several southern states. Um, and in some southern states, parking was even segregated, which was somehow one of the most surprising things I found out. Um, just to catch up on my PowerPoint, here's a, one of the used cars dealership. There was a really lively market in used cars which is where a lot of blacks were buying cars. Um, and here's one incident of parking violation, which was at a Firestone pl plant in Memphis. Um, typically, I mean, parking, I guess, is always somewhat hierarchical, and typically blacks would get these kind of unpaved off-road parking further from where you had to go. Um, so 
In other words, although African Americans had hoped that cars would offer escape from Jim Grove, the invention of the automobile offered a new form of ex a new and extremely complex form of traveling black. Um, so in the remainder of my talk, I'm just going to highlight some of the highlights of the system. Um, the freedom offered by a car was um, psychological as well as um, just an escape from the train itself. Um, Cruising down the public highways that began to crisscross the Americas in the 1920s, black riders were black drivers were not easily identifiable by race. Um, African American car owners felt that they could achieve effective equality at 25 miles an hour or or above, um, and enjoyed that freedom. Um, Cars also obviously appealed to black drivers for the same reason they appealed to white drivers. Um, they were an important middle class status system. And in still largely rural South, they eased the social isolation experienced by farm families, um, which helps explain why even poor black sharecroppers were quick to buy cars in years when cotton prices were high. However, um, cars were beyond many black travelers' means and never really allowed even well-to-do blacks to fully escape segregation. Um, for all that early African-American drivers claimed that race was almost completely ignored on public highways, driving presented a variety of problems, both old and new. Um, municipal roads and back roads were never as easy to navigate as, hi navigate as highways. Um, Indeed, in some Jim Crow, some southern towns, Jim Crow etiquette extended even to the rules of the road. At many four-way stop intersections in the South during the segregation era, historian Jer Jerome Packard notes, the right-of-way was not determined by who reached the intersection first, but rather by the race of the driver. Gender further reinforced such hierarchies um, when confronting a driver who was a white female, a black male driver in the South, could and sometimes did face a life or death decision. And passing white drivers of either genders on slow, dusty roads was also problematic. In Mississippi, for example, local custom forbade black drivers from overtaking white drivers on unpaved roads because of the dust that they would shower. Um, Parking segregation fell into the same thing, the same kind of hierarchy. Um, the segregation rules of the road didn't last indefinitely because many of them were unworkable. Um, on the highway, as Charles Johnson, sociologist Charles Johnson found when he was researching in the 1940s, the racial right of way was virtually impossible to honor. Um, at high speeds, nobody could identify the race of the driver without further identification. Usually you would, he said, be by before they know who you are and whether you're colored. Um, so blacks would often just take the right of way if they have it. And even on local roads, the racial right of way system conflicted with both the laws and logic of traffic regulation that made it impossible for blacks to follow it at all times. A black driver who gave several white drivers the right of way could end up holding up other white drivers who were behind him and would surely end up offending somebody. Some whites don't like it when you don't wait for them to get away first, one black informant who largely disregard white claims to superior on the road, told Johnson. But when there's a lot of traffic, you cannot bother them because you tie up traffic and it would be worse. Um, blacks also tended to resist racial right away whenever they thought they could get away with it. Several informants who spoke to Johnson told him that it was possible to bluff people out of the way by driving quickly and aggressively. As Johnson describes, Johnson describes such practices in detail, writing, with white men, the Negro may sometimes indulge in bluffing in traffic. He may appear to be driving with a minimum of caution when in reality he's employing a great deal of skill. 
He attempt, attempts to obtain his traffic right away by innocently driving his very rickety car very close to the white man's shining automobile. They both know that an event of co collision, about all the white man can get is personal vengeance, which might give him a measure of satisfaction, but will not repair his car. In discussing driving conditions in the South almost 20 years later, writer Stetson Kennedy also noted that uh, such calculations and bluffing and the bluffing they inspired were still commonplace. One of the best forms of protection that non-white motorists have in the South is a dilapidated car, he noted. White motorists are less likely to impose on the driver of such a vehicle, it being assumed that the brakes are no good and that the owner will care little if it's wrecked and that the owner is financially unable to pay for any damage that it might cause to a white car owner's car. This system, as at work, was made more complicated by the fact that even in the rural South, racial right away was never universal. Some places, um, whites did maintain normal driving rules, according to many reports. Um, um, and in others, Jim Crow was more important to traffic safety. So given that driving rules vary, black travelers always had to drive with care. Um, African-American travelers, when venturing into unfamiliar territory, often pulled aside for white drivers as a precautionary measure. They also tended to stay on interstate highways whenever they could, and sometimes drove the South's back roads only at night in the hopes of avoiding confrontations with white drivers. Moreover, African-American drivers had a variety of reasons to avoid such confrontation. When it came to insurance, in particular, they faced another kind of racial right away if they got into an accident. In the South, custom dictated that if there is a collision, the Negro does not expect to get paid for damages to his own car, whether entitled to them or not. And in the North, the custom does not seem to have been very different. African Americans throughout the country had a great deal of trouble getting automobile insurance. Uh, the history of automobile insurance uh, policies um, regarding African Americans and the regulation of insurance companies varies um, from state to state and hasn't received much historical work. Um, but both African American newspapers and NAACP files reveal that throughout the interwar years, many automobile companies simply refused to insure black drivers on the grounds that they would always be held at fault should they get into any accident that went to court. Um, and here you can see um, automobile clubs used to handle insurance, and here's one where they actually just, just, just say membership is limited to the white race. Um, um, and such provisions were, were common, um, and people were often quite frank about them. Um, for instance, one uh, insurance company wrote to a black applicant, uh, it's generally understood that insurance companies do, want, do not want Negroes as risks. Um, this was in 1933. Um, a year later, another insurance company canceled all of its African American policyholders' on accounts due to the fact the Negro that if a Negro and a white man are in an automobile accident, the Negro will be blamed regardless of circumstance. Other insurance agencies were a little more welcoming but not enthusiastic. One called Equitable Building told a reporter for the Baltimore African American who investigated the subject in 1933, our company as a general rule does not accept colored business, except when the particular colored person is in a business and a profession, it might make a difference and they would be considered as any other risk. So African Americans who wish to insure their cars and automobile insurance was not required by law in most states prior to the 1950s, um, but people who wish to insure their cars had a limited number of companies they could go to, most of which were underfinanced and most of which were black owned. Um, such firms were hard to find, though. A court-ordered investigation of the automobile insurance company, of automobile insurance companies' practices in Illinois, conducted in 1939, 
um, looked at the practice of 47 different companies and found that 44 of them refused to insure Negroes, and three said that they would only do so under certain circumstances. Not surprisingly then, the NAACP received regular correspondence from members looking for lists of insurance companies willing to accept black policyholders uh, during the 1930s and also at that time began challenging state lawmakers in several different states to address the same issue. Um, but in states where insurance was not mandatory or linked to any other, linked to driving privileges such as securing a license or registering a car, uh, the kind of discrimination experienced in insurance was hard to fight. Um, Thurgood Marshall's insurance was canceled in 1940, um, and there was nothing he could do about it. Um, the insurance company's uh, official reason for canceling his insurance was that he lived in a congested area, uh, Harlem, um, <laughs> and he consulted several people um, and was told that he really just couldn't, he didn't have a case. Uh, so he moved on. <laughs> um, black drivers faced also almost equally ubiquitous challenges when it came to consumption on the road. Traveling any distance by car requires stops for food, gas, and accommodations. Um, and of course, traveling often took African American drivers outside their own communities into terrain where they could never be quite certain what kind of discrimination was in force. Uh, African American travelers were not allowed to use the restrooms in many southern service stations. And there were also reports that some stations, there are also reports that some stations did not want black people to even come in and buy gas and oil. Um, an example of retail racism, such slights actually had an economic rationale. Um, Black consumers were far from the primary target of the service station industry that developed alongside the automotive industry. Um, retailers in this industry were faced with the challenge of selling largely indistinguishable products such as motor oil and gasoline. Um, and as a result, they began to market themselves by creating welcome home-like environments that would ensure consumer loyalty in an era when most car owners were white. They were also courting women drivers. So to, to do this, um, by the beginning of the late 20s, Shell, Standard Oil, Sunoco, and Texaco all began to bring, build these English cottage style uh, stations complete with chimneys, gabled roofs, shuttered windows, flower boxes. You can still see them around today, and I never really thought about why they look the way they do, but they were about courting women drivers and making them feel at home and like this was a sort of domestic sphere you could enter. Um, this was all done very deliberately. Uh, Petroleum News, the industry's main journal, advised station owners to dress your station with flowers. Um, Several stations also um, advertised home clean restrooms, um, to use Shell Oil's catchphrase. Um, and Texaco even countered the home clean advertising campaign by advertising a white patrol of 48 inspectors who traversed the country to make sure their facilities, uh, the company's facilities were clean. Unfortunately, the domestic ideals that the white patrol policed were white. Black people had little place in the sheltered home-like environment that early service stations sought to create. Accordingly, even where they could buy gas, then black travelers often found themselves barred from using the bathrooms, lunch counters, soda fountains, and restaurants at roadside service stations. In the South, such accommodations were actually segregated by law, but segregation was also common Elsewhere, um, uh, here's a sign from Lancaster, Ohio, in a, in a restaurant. Um, and another example would be a restaurant at the Standard Oil Myers Station near Joliet, Illinois, um, which for many years greeted travelers with a large, we do not cater to colored signs. Um, this persisted until 1948 when Illinois State Representative Cornel Davis finally persuaded the company to have it removed. Um, 
Black passengers were initially unwelcome on buses in both the North and South, at least in part because of these kind of circumstances. The bus companies were simply not prepared to supply black passengers with accommodations or bathrooms or places to eat on extended bus trips. Uh, blacks who drove their own cars were slightly better off because um, they could assemble Jim Crow kits before driving any distance. They loaded up their cars with food, water, and maps which they carried so they wouldn't have to stop and ask for directions. Um, and they also brought along amenities such as toilet paper and pecans um, on the assumption that they might not be able to use roadside restaurants. Many drivers even filled their gas tanks before leaving home, carrying additional gas in the trunks of their car in case they encountered the kinds of service stations that did not cater to blacks. The challenges faced by African-American drivers also gave rise to a variety of travel guides that helped them figure out where they could stop. Um, the Green Book is the one that everyone has begun to talk about recently, um, but there were a whole bunch of them published between the 1930s and 1960s. Um, they included Hackley and Harrison's Hotel and Apartment Guide for Colored Travelers, Grayson's Guide, the Green Books, the Go Guide to Pleasant Motoring, and Travel Guide. Uh, the first, su first, first such book that I found, and I, I do occasionally come across new ones, so I, I feel like I, there's probably more, but the first one I've looked at is the Hackley and Harrison Guide, and it was the brainchild of Edwin Hackley Harrison, a lawyer and a journalist, and Sarah D. Harrison, um, who was the secretary of the New London, Connecticut's Negro Welfare Camp Council. It opened with an illustration of the kind of service it would design to provide, which took the form of a November 8, 1929 letter from W.E.B. Du Bois to Harrison. Um, du Bois had been anticipating a trip through Connecticut later that month, and he asked Harrison, who sometimes rented out her spare bedroom, whether there was a colored boarding house in New London. He further explained that he was traveling by car and hoped to spend the night there. His letter reveals that like most black drivers, um, Du Bois could not simply travel to an unfamiliar town and assume he would find some place to stay. Indeed, by the time he wrote Harrison, Du Bois had already circulated his first inquiry about colored boarding houses in New London. And a, and in a, in a letter earlier, written earlier that week, um, that's how he had gotten Harrison's name, um, and he ultimately was able to make arrangements to stay with her. And Hackley and Harrison's guide was addressed the problem that Du Bois faced. Um, its listings and its listings further underscore just how difficult it was for black travelers to find accommodation. It was national in scope. But it listed comparatively few hotels or easily identifiable commercial establishments. Instead, the predominant form of accommodations for black travelers in many towns would have been all but impossible for a stranger to find without local assistance. They were mostly rooms such as Sarah Harrison's extra bed to, bedroom, which the guide described as private accommodations available conditionally. Um, the guide was short-lived. It appeared just as the Great Depression decimated the travel market, and shortly after its publication, Edwin Henry Hackley died. But subsequent guides would prove more enduring. First, the Green Book was first published in 1936 and became the longest lasting and mostly widely distributed of the guides. Um, it was republished it was republished annually for 30 years and reached a circulation high of reportedly 2 million in 1962. It was founded by Victor Green, a New Jersey mailman who ran the Green Book Company with his wife and brother. He modeled his guide on two very different publications. One was the Automobile Green Book, which was a guide to the East Coast published by the Automobile Legal Association. And the other was the New York City's organized Keshrith Laboratories Kosher Food Guide. Um, the latter was published quarterly, and it was designed primarily to serve as a guide for observant Jewish women desiring to uphold dietary laws. 
In addition to approving packaged foods, it also enumerated hotels, summer resorts, and camps that cater to Jewish travelers. Uh, the Negro Motorist Green Book combines features of both these publications, offering road information and travel tips, together with geographically organized um, listings of hotels, restaurants, taverns, drugstores, service stations, beauty parlors, and barber shops that welcome black travelers. Initially, it focused largely on the New York area, but over time, it expanded to list roadside accomplish, uh, establishments across the US and beyond. Just what you have been looking for, now we can travel without embarrassment, the Green Book proclaimed in its ads. While Travel Guide, another guide, bore the motto, vacation and recreation without humiliation. However, even when they employed such guides, African-American travelers still found road trips difficult and sometimes dangerous. Um, the guides were often out of date, and beyond that, um, African-Americans who drove nice cars were often subject to police scrutiny and white hostility, and roadside accommodations of all kinds remained a big problem in terms of just pure availability. A nationwide survey of hotels conducted in, 1950, in the 1950s found that 94% of them did not admit blacks, and colored hotels were often abysmal. The black writer John Williams, who used the travel guide to drive cross country in the mid 60s, found some of the accommodations that he was directed to were simply un uninhabitable. After arriving at yet another dilapidated hotel in Jackson, Mississippi, where he had coffee in, it, in a dingy little dining room and rushed out overwhelmed by the place, <coughs> He contemplated mournfully that segregation has made many of us lazy, but it's also made many of us rich without trying. Um, such hotels, he reflected, had no competition, therefore it was take it or leave it, and you have to take it. The slovenly restaurant keeper, the uncaring hotel man, the parasites of segregation have only to provide the superficial utensils of their business. And as a consequence of these kinds of conditions, um, black automobility had, a strange, had strange contours. Um, it took shape during a time when white drivers were negotiating an increasingly seamless world of commercialized travel choices filled with opportunities for roadside camaraderie. Um, during these years, blacks were often confined to their cars. The stark isolation in which they traveled is most memorably captured by African-American scholar John Hope Franklin's account of driving from Charleston, South Carolina to Raleigh, North Carolina on December 7, 1941, the day that the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Although the news of the attack was broadcast shortly after 2 p.m. that day, Franklin and his wife Aurelia knew nothing about it until they arrived in Raleigh that evening. Their car had no radio. And like most black families motoring through the Jim Crow South, they had packed box lunches to avoid the humiliation of being turned away from restaurants and relieved themselves in roadside ditches because station, service station restaurants were often closed to them. Um, so that is the distinctive contours of traveling black. I think I will stop there and take questions. Yes. Um, they were, they were, they were different state by state. Um, but as far as I can tell, most of the policies did change as states moved towards requiring insurance. Um, oftentimes, that required them to the states to actually negotiate with insurers, which they did sometimes first by creating these sort of pools of places that would accept, but generally, ultimately involved pushing the insurers to stop discriminating. It's a, it's, but it's in the in the fifties really that it really begins to give way. Yes. Oh, John, you go. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, Mia, you know I'm a racing fan, so um, <laughs> I hope you're going to have a few paragraphs in there about the 
African American Racers Associations that popped up around the country. I know about it's them. I haven't country. written anything about them, but they are very interesting. Yeah. My father came from a farming family, and I'm wondering if you came across anything that suggested that black farmers were hesitant to mechanize for the same reason that black people might have been hesitant to buy a fancy car. Mm -hmm. The two, where they would be hesitant to buy a farm truck or a nice mm -hmm. farm truck, hesitant to buy um, uh, a, a tractor or something that was conspicuous technologically inexpensive. Um, I think so. I mean, I, um, though it could go either way, I'm thinking of, uh, who's it? Uh, the guy that Nell Painter writes about, the, the guy he interviewed. Oh, yeah, uh, Hudson. yeah, Hosea Hudson was like, when he, he heard the black people weren't supposed to own fancy cars, he went out and got himself mm -hmm. one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, 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 the market really does, um, among, in the rural south, did seem to be off in these very dilapidated Ford cars. Mm -hmm. So I think you could get away with it. But I, I think it's something people had to think about. Yes. Yeah, I noticed if you could go back a few slides. Mm -hmm. I think it was Mary Walcott, the, the, the Marianne Walcott, the photographer. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, and then I didn't recognize that image from Ben Sean. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I'm just thinking about whether you're taking up um, uh, the place, the photography in the context of this project, you know, you, I think of Walker Evans and all mm -hmm. the numerous photo photographs of uh, of the traveling families yeah, and, and also cars. Cars. Uh, and so, just wonder. That's yeah. Just kind of a side question. I have another question, but no. I mean, uh, I've been fascinated by the imagery, and I'm using it to illustrate, but I haven't really, I haven't been studying it in uh -huh. any way. But there was one, the Marion Walcott one, Let's see. in the caption. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, many Negroes spend their cotton picking money on used cars, mm -hmm. right? And it just got me thinking about um, the idea of black car ownership. Mm -hmm. Uh, as wasteful, mm -hmm. and the ways in which black people themselves participated in that. Maybe not, I mean, well, obviously not in total, mm -hmm. but there are these notions oh, yeah. that consumption in general, you know, uh, James Weldon Johnson has this famous throwaway line in Harlem Culture Capital, mm -hmm. where he talks about um, a sharecropper who goes into a place to buy five phonographs for each mm -hmm. of his five children. And, and that is supposed to be uh, evidence that people given a little bit of money, black people given a little bit of money will waste it. And that that is un-American. So I'm wondering, uh, yeah, there's a question about the Cadillac. <laughs> there, I mean, there, there, you know, I did, I did a lot of like Google searching just for like Negroes and automobiles uh -huh. and stuff like that. And there are, it's often these kind of disapproving remarks uh -huh. about black buying cars, blacks not needing cars. Uh -huh. uh, but this is also a time when um, white farmers under similar circumstances are buying cars. They're even using cars. They sometimes take out the motor and use the car as machinery to, to help on the farm. I mean, there's a really good reason why if you're a rural farm family, you might buy a car. So. So um, it, it does seem to be that disapproving thing, and the Cadillac thing is to the disapproval of nice cars. But oddly enough, what is rarely recognized is this is also the times when um, whites are buying land or they're buying houses, and blacks are being blocked out of this kind of purchase. So actually buying cars and consumer goods are oh, what African Americans can buy. Um, and, and cars in particular, used cars, are really not that expensive. So um, the, the disapproval is, is not, it, it's not a mystery why they're buying cars. It's more of a mystery. The disapproval is, is, makes less sense in a certain way. Yes. Yeah, actually, I had a question kind of along those same lines, that with regards to lending practices, mm -hmm. the fact that often, you know, it's much easier to be able to you know, get a loan to buy a car than to get a mortgage right. if you're black and, and in American post-war America, and I guess what, as far as the discrimination of African American borrowers um, by, say, you know, used car lots, was that something that you're looking at as well, and looking at, you know, what are the difference, racial differentials in lending practices? Um, no, I'm not looking at it as carefully as I would like, just because that would be like another project. But um, 
there's, there's definitely discrimination against African Americans buying new cars. There's brands that don't necessarily want to be associated with black buyers. Mm. There is a mm. sense that black buyers can't afford cars. In used car operations in the South, um, I forgot the details of how it worked, but um, as they were they were after the sharecroppers cotton picking money like everyone yeah, everyone yeah. else. More like predatory lending in the sense. Yeah, there was predat there was that kind of predatory lending mm -hmm. went on, and they, they, these were among the institutions that were competing for yeah. black dollars. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a story there, but maybe for someone else to write, I think. <laughs> yes, in the back. Um, the businesses that uh, operated in like, areas I had a lot of black people that I grew up with, a large part of the population, did they have a lot of trouble you know, operating at the level that they wanted to, or a lot of trouble standing in business since they excluded the I guess since they narrowed their market and they weren't including uh, all the consumers they could? Um, that's a good question. I, th I mean, I think that it became clear after the 1964 civil rights law opened things up that there was, there was, there was, there had been a sense among a lot of these white establishments that excluding black people was necessary because whites would all take their business elsewhere. And, and that didn't prove to be the case, though that was also partially because desegregation kind of comes all at once. But I mean, I think, I think they did not necessarily profit from it, but they thought they did. I mean, they thought that this is what um, sort of kept them in business, that they excluded black people. And I think that, I mean, one of the interesting things about retail is the fact that there's a lot of um, assumptions made about marketing and selling things that are not necessarily correct or done on the basis of any sort of data. Um, you know, like the, the fact that um, car brands or car, it was, there was no real attempt to sell new cars to black people for many years. Doesn't seem like it was particularly profitable for people who sold cars. That's also something I've been thinking about. It's, it's a good question. I mean, part of what happens in a really complicated way during the civil rights movement era is that you have a society that's increasingly mobile in which you're, you're trying to kind of um, encourage everyone to use your services and, and, and sort of be able to use them in one place as well as another place. And these local and regional customs become more and more difficult to sustain. One of the reasons why certain, certain kinds, kinds of businesses, businesses desegregated even before required to do so during law, uh, by law during the civil rights movement was because they were national chains, like Woolworths and other places where people protested and picketed, not just in the North, but the South, caved fairly quickly. So I think there's a way in which um, segregation didn't entirely fit the kind of sort of national marketing schemes of modern biz big business. Um, in ways that may have helped to contribute to its demise. Yes. Um, so I noticed the image of the airplane on the green book. Mm -hmm. And I was really curious about what that might signify, particularly in terms of audience. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the green book was also interested in black audiences that were not necessarily from the US, so either from the Caribbean and African continent or elsewhere. Um, but that it also mm -hmm. It did deal, by the, by the, I can't remember what year the one I showed you is from, but by the end of its history, um, this is from 1956, so by the 50s and 60s it began to have small entries on traveling beyond the U.S. During these years you also had some black travel agents that were um, helping um, a new generation of black travelers who traveled beyond the U.S. I don't, I don't think, think the Green Book was addressing people who did not live in the U.S., um, but, it, but it, it was certainly thinking about the black traveler as someone who would travel widely. Yes? I was wondering about the ways in which travel impacted the black community's understanding of citizenship, because mm -hmm. you mentioned the fact that they viewed it as a way to escape Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. And so whether or not it allowed them to view citizenship not so much rooted in property as white Americans kind of viewed it at this time, but more so in the mobility um, 
and the freedom to travel. I, I think it did, or I mean, yeah, the, the connection, I think traveling did expand a lot of black Americans' sense of um, themselves as an American citizen with certain kinds of rights. Um, both wars, World War I and World War II, took many um, black men and somewhat less numbers of black women far from home. For black Southerners, the experience of traveling in the wartime made, made segregation visible to them in certain ways. I um, mean, I remember Carl Rohn, who's a black journalist, wrote that growing up in Arkansas, he didn't really notice segregation. It was just like automatic. This is how things are. And it wasn't until he joined the Navy that he all of a sudden began to sort of understand it. And then when he traveled back to the South, after um, spending some time in the Navy and working in Minnesota, he, he, you know, he all of a sudden found segregation to be this welter of rules that he could, didn't even know how to abide by, and he noticed it varied from place to place. So um, it exposed that things were done differently elsewhere. Um, and then the wars itself and the kinds of commitments to democracy, especially in the Second World War, underscored that it was kind of an American citizenship that was being advertised um, that wasn't being fulfilled in the South. And all of this helped contribute to the coming of the civil rights movement. Yes. <laughs> no, yeah. Going back over here. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. And, uh, as my apologies for being so we like, um, this. I love the term honorability and mm -hmm. the rights and the liberty rights about mm -hmm. you know, these sorts of things. Anyway. Um, and, and much of your talk is sort of uh, positioning um, uh, African Americans operating and using honorability within sort of a Jim Crow South. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you're in your research or as you take mm -hmm. this further, uh, are you invested in probing or have you come across different ways in which automobility is being negotiated between the different classes of African Americans mm -hmm. um, sort of aggressively? Uh, it, it, does it happen? I mean, I know there's definitely this outward pressure mm -hmm. coming from sort of Jim Crow white America, but I'm wondering if it's if this way in which it's either aggressively or subtly being negotiated also within the black working class versus the black upper classes, um, if it becomes a way to express that sort of class standing as well. Well, I, I think definitely the sort of middle class African Americans for, uh, for car ownership or actually use of planes and stuff were these sort of marks of class status that people emphasized. In fact, in black newspapers, in the 40s, you have like pictures of social, black socialites getting on and off planes, and it's kind of like you've arrived, and um, you know, there's, a, there's an emphasis, emphasis on you know a certain, a certain class that people would never ever dream of traveling in the Jim Crow car. They would always just use their car. Um, so, so it, it definitely does sort of police that line, but it's complicated by the fact that you know cars exist at sort of almost all price points, especially during that time period, and. Part of what develops um, in the South is a kind of culture of black mechanics, people who can buy like a $50 Ford and make it run. You know, so that like owning a car in itself does not, you know, you know, is not something that only middle class people can do. Yes. I think John also. Okay. But yeah, I remember growing up in Alabama and black newspaper, the Birmingham World. Mm -hmm. The standard feature of the Birmingham World was a section about who was going where mm -hmm. on vacation. And it was not typically, it, the, the language of the newspaper was uh, Mia Bay and family motored right. to Detroit. <laughs> yeah. Motored was always the operative term. Mm -hmm. So that's just an observation. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't being rude. I was looking to correct my memory or make sure my memory was correct about what has always been for me a fairly aggravated chapter in Paul Gilroy's Darker Than Blue. Right. right. Yes. He yes. has, he has a, a driving while well black chapter. chapter. Yeah, he yes. definitely has mm -hmm. a driving while black chapter. But the part of the chapter that didn't aggravate me was his observation, not borne out by your mm -hmm. talk, that, that um, black consumers were courted, even in the automobile industry mm -hmm. and that their that courtship reflected their diminishing distance from 
American ideas of American citizenship. Mm -hmm. And we see some that there is some coextensive relationship between US citizenship and car ownership. Mm -hmm. Car kind of cyber makes right. that same point uh, in his book on automobility. So you if I'm, I'm hearing sorry. you're you're Maybe, Maybe because I started at an early point in time. I mean, the courtship just started, started in, in the 50s, 50s, but prior to that, I mean, I, they, they, I, and I wish I, could, I came across like the first um, automobile industry ad directed at black some time ago, and I, of course, can't figure out where it was now, but I'll find it again. But, but and it, was, it was like a, the ad was like buy a car. It wasn't even any particular make or model because nobody actually wanted to be advertising to black people like Cadillac or Chevrolet or Buick. It was just like black people buy some cars. Um, so there was a real hesitation about it. And there was like Cadillac had very mixed feelings about the idea that um, blacks, you know, were Cadillac owners. So, you know, I mean, Certainly, I'm sure on some level, of our, um, um, businesses had an interest in black buyers, but they did not court them until the 1950s. The, the absolute absence of any kind of advertising really suggests otherwise, as well as the images you see in the advertising that is done for cars um, includes no black people until, well, that 1957 ad I showed you was one of the first. Yes, John. Well, this is so stimulating. I've got so much. But would you go back to the picture that Deborah wanted to look at, the uh, Marion Post Walcott? And I just want to say that she made this image, Deborah, in Belzoni, Mississippi, mm -hmm. which is the same place she made the image that I see <coughs> of the African American man climbing the right. exterior the steps the going up to the yeah. Jim Crow right. theater. The theater. So right. an, an interesting resonance mm -hmm. here. And I'll. Mm -hmm. We'll tell you about this picture. <laughs> okay. Are you still writing a chapter on buses? Yes, yes I've written a chapter on buses. buses. Are you still writing it? Well, well and the book is an out. So, <laughs> so I think Deborah is right that there is some visual evidence that could really enrich mm -hmm. what you're doing. Mm -hmm. One of the Farm Security Administration Office of War Information photographers called Esther Bubbly. Mm -hmm. She took cross-country bus trips. Mm -hmm. right. She was extremely sensitive to racial dynamics mm -hmm. in, it's in her pictures. Um, just incredibly okay. rich visual art mm -hmm. that you might want to look at. Okay. Yeah. I think yeah. I've looked at some, but I will. Yeah. I will, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, automobility for, it's interesting that we've got the international connection. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know about the episode with African diplomats yes. who were discriminated against on Highway 40 between mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. New York and Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Okay, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. Um, I hope you're going to write about that. I have written. Really I have written, written about the yeah, African diplomats. Yeah. yeah, and there's a really good visuals on that too in Life exactly. magazine, as you probably it's know. Okay, so last thing, right. <laughs> the last yes. thing I'm going yes. to say is that there is a uh, an African American owned business that appeared in the Green Book on a regular mm -hmm. basis that's still open in Charlottesville. It's oh. Joker's Barbershop that's on Commerce Street across from the Jefferson School. Okay. It's still there, still open. They'll cut your hair as they have ever since 1936. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. I saw a couple of hands back there. Yes. Yeah, I was, so I was wondering about what kinds of opportunities were made available by the limitations of travel. So I'm thinking of um, the boarding house <laughs> mm -hmm. that the boys is going to go to. Right. Um, what kinds of conversations does that open up to people who might have there been like hotels and whatnot, um, not actually been able to have those kinds of conversations? Well, it certainly, I mean, it certainly did mean that for a, a lot of African Americans, um, some kind of boarding house rooms to let situation was a way that you could make ends meet. Um, you know, property owners, um, there were also some colored hotels, there were segregated businesses that, you know, really did sort of rely on segregation. I don't, I don't, I've never really come across people kind of speaking of this as a golden age. I mean, there were, there were. <laughs> 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 I guess my question is coming from, like, I don't think it was a golden age, right. but like, so my great grandma ran a boarding house mm -hmm. similar in, in Madison. Right. Which, yeah, it was to make ends meet, but mm -hmm. at the same time, when my Right. This person, that was what we heard about in our family well, at 
I think, and I think the golden age part of it was actually the kind of networking it imposed on people. I mean, people who were going somewhere would get in touch with their friends and, you know, and, and there would be this whole kind of, you know, like, um, you know, especially like, well, this was especially true of middle class people who had room and other middle class people would, you know, stay with them, and so everyone ended up kind of knowing each other, um, and all kinds of, uh, you know, all kinds of networks were really sustained this way. So, and, and this, this is true of, of Jim Crow generally. It provided certain kinds of opportunities uh, for fellowship and networking that um, don't exist anymore. Like, for instance, in the Jim Crow car, people not only brought fried chicken, but they usually brought more than they needed to eat because one thing you get in the Jim Crow car is maybe offer some other people food mm -hmm. because nobody else, you know, because food was hard to come by for everyone. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like soldiers traveling during the war would say they'd get in the Jim Crow car and just look for some like nice looking woman with a big box of, <laughs> a big shoe box full of chicken and sit beside her. <laughs> so it created those kinds of community. <laughs> Um, I think I saw it. I have a really oh, yeah. possibly related question about sort of, not, maybe not opportunities, but possibilities within mm -hmm. the sort of Jim Crow system at that time. And I was really struck by the, the anecdote about when the car is moving, mm -hmm. there's some sort of ambiguity about who's in right. the car. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you can sort of meditate on that. And maybe this dynamic that I was really interested in about the strange desire to sometimes court um, black people to buy cars, but then at the same time, there are risks, sort of on, uh, from a financial mm -hmm. perspective, and on the road, you know, in a weird way, risk is operating in, in kind of interesting ways. It seems mm -hmm. in terms of how drivers, in those moments of encounters of, of passing or of just being on the road together, maybe not stopped, but over 25 miles per hour, perhaps. And if you can maybe talk a little bit more about those moments of maybe the sort of ambiguity and mm -hmm. messiness of, of that moment in time. Well, I mean, I think these moments are maybe one reason why travel is such, is so fraught. I mean, literally from the invention of the stagecoach, there was sort of these fears that you would be in the stagecoach and there would be a woman in a veil and she would actually be a black person. You know, like, and she'd be like sitting beside you in the stagecoach. And, Likewise, you know, cars and black people were problematic because, you know, once the cars are closed, you don't, you don't know who's who and what they're doing and, and, you know, what kind of freedom they might have to be, you know, um, you know, have a car, have a better car than you or, or, you know, sort of be driving on equal terms with you. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why travel is, is, so fraught and contested. And in terms of things like luxury brands, I mean, still today, manufacturers have a very ambiguous relationship between wanting black customers but not necessarily wanting to be associated um, mm -hmm. with a black customer base or also mm -hmm. in, in, some, in, in many cases also wanting black customer, wanting maybe even using black customers in advertising, but then like store owners, when black customers come in and try to buy that watch are like, that big and first <laughs> yeah, you can't afford that. that, you're stealing it, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. So um, it, it's, it's complicated, the sort of signing around luxury goods versus whether people are supposed to be able to use them or not. Yes. Um, well, I mean, I think part of the discourse of whether or not blacks should be buying cars is part of it is a question about investments. And the one thing I did, I spent some time trying to figure out how many, you know, how many black people had cars, mm -hmm. I mean, and which they really didn't collect a lot of data mm -hmm. on, but I found, um, found a useful study from one state where they had asked a whole bunch of black mine workers about their car ownership patterns. And a lot of them had owned a car 
for some period of time. So people, I mean, poor people would buy inexpensive used cars, which then wouldn't work very well. And also, if they didn't have money, they would be able to replace the tires. So you have a lot of people who sort of own cars that may or may not run, that run sometimes, um, and, and run when they don't. I don't, I don't know that they end up being a, a, a great investment. I don't know if cars generally are, are a great investment, but it's sort of a question of utility, I think, more than investment. Um, and, but, but for a group who don't have access to a lot of other investments, you know, utility is actually important. You know, there are these, um, I'm wondering about the, the gender analytic. Mm -hmm. I mean, kind of speaking in the most gross, grossly general ways about men and movement. I mean, facility mm -hmm. is archetypically associated right. with women mm -hmm. and mobility with right. men. What is your research suggesting about black women and automobility? Um, you know, that it was, in general, for black women, the, the travel issues were even worse. Um, they were worse for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, um, women who were pregnant obviously found things like traveling by train really difficult. But then, you know, um, in the car owning days, families often didn't want black women to be driving by themselves. All these in kind of difficulties you encounter on the road, the difficulties of finding places to stay, places to stop, just seemed doubly dangerous for women. So I would, I would suspect that um, driving is even more male among African Americans during, at least, you know, during the early years of the automotive age than it is among whites, um, and um, and also, I mean, obviously for women, all the Jim Crow humiliations, like you know, going to the bathroom by the roadside, are just way worse and potentially more potentially more dangerous. For women. So, were women waived off then of car use? Uh, no, I mean, women learned how to drive and bought cars, but I've just seen a lot of instances where you know, like somebody like W. B. Du Bois, he actually encouraged his daughter to buy a car, but he also would be like, you know, like if it was a long trip, he would want her to be going with, some, with, with a man. Yeah. I mean, part of the emphasis on Ford's is, in fact, that Ford does employ black workers in Detroit, um, and there's a lot of black men working for Ford. Um, people who work for Ford often um, bought Ford's, but then the brand also it called, it had, a, had a certain loyalty. Um, and then beyond making, there was also all this kind of, I mean, people, people People did incredibly creative things, sort of rebuilding cars. So there was there was a variety. Of people had the automo automotive knowledge, which was initially thought to be like, you know, something that white people had a special talent for, actually spread fairly rapidly through the black community. In part because, in part because of the investment in Ford, but also because a lot of blacks worked as chauffeurs. Um, um, and in the South, you also ended up with a fair amount of garages that were black owned or black rent run or black working as auto mechanics. So it's an area of expertise that black men take pride in. Yes. Kind of a follow up to that question. It makes me think of Zora Anderson as, you know, driving this Fanny Hurst car right around. And so to tie in with like the labor and the chauffeur and the I don't know, but it, it's interesting to think about her as a figure that might 
Yeah, so she has a really interesting short piece. I don't know if you remember it, Deborah, where she's driving around Florida and everyone is like amazed that she's this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. She, I mean, she loved cars, and and she would insist that her patron supply her with a, with a car. Yeah. <laughs> and it brought her, in terms of her field work, a kind of access. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 So I haven't really thought much beyond that, but she's a certainly interesting figure in the whole driving world. You had another question. I mean, I think it certainly created a certain kind of culture around it. I mean, it's about, it was a culture about like, every time you went somewhere, you had to figure out exactly where you were going, who you were going to see, where you were going to stop, where the potential danger points might be. And um, it, it, it involved a kind of level of sort of research and foresight that I, I wouldn't have been to everyone's taste, I think. Um, and it made, I think it made some people nervous about traveling. I mean, the whole automotive age also coincides though with the Great Migration. So people are moving and they're, you know, they're, uh, and the wars. So there's a limit to how anyone can stay in one place. But it, it certainly made, made travel difficult enough that I think some people were nervous and hesitant about it. Well, I guess classes are <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.